of the studies talked about backlash and they were persuasive. Um, can you speak to a sense of, do you, have you looked at the dynamics of the backlash? Do you see backlash as being a transient phenomenon, a more long-term phenomenon? What do we know about the, the timeline on which backlash happens and, and is there optimism that it would subside? That would go in line with what Ashwini was just saying, right? <laughs> that if there is backlash, it's a sort of adjustment cost or how should we think about it? So I guess... <laughs> uh, so actually, I didn't mention this, but in my paper, that result I showed you where there was backlash is for people who've experienced quotas uh, more than uh, once, I think at least once. So yes. then when you've experienced quotas two or three times, then this backlash goes away. Hmm. So uh, we show that at least this is a short-term backlash, but in the long term, uh, we kind of argue and we show a little bit that norms update and change and sh uh, consistent with the fact that it's only short term. So, yeah, so that's not something I have tested yet, uh, I shall. Uh, but it's indeed consistent with, I mean, I expect to find results consistent with what uh, Joseph is pointing out, and it's also consistent with other papers that show that norm update with time, so that you need to have this repetition, such that you have also a lower in interaction and in implicit association taste and things like that. So that would make sense. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, uh, Joe's results uh, are absolutely what we find also in India, which is both for gender and for caste, uh, what started as a more kind of a formal mechanism has now created a set of individuals who are respect, I mean, respected and valued more than other members of their community are. Um, and so I, I definitely believe that it's a transient phenomenon, the backlash. Yeah. Long term. Yeah, well, one of my questions just got answered, but I'll sort of restate it. So uh, I was trying to sort of figure out, um, uh, Professor Deshpande was saying that there's no uh, efficiency effect in the railway sector over time, yet the backlash studies show there's some sort of, uh, for example, an effort effect. And so perhaps the way to square the sort of, uh, the, the, to make the, the two consistent would be that backlash is a, is a short-term effect. That's what I sort of understood from this discussion. My other question is, um, uh, is so to uh, to Joe, is when you say uh, beliefs about um, skill gaps or beliefs about disadvantage, for lack of a better word, uh, when you say beliefs and skill gaps, it seems like it's sanitizing, um, you know, sort of racial beliefs. Because you know, racism has this inherent idea of their, these are the skill gaps, and they are sort of biologically determined, and we could just call them skill gaps, but at the base would be something that's much more. Uh, it's not really sort of an of course, right? And so, how do we think about racism in, in this sort of perspective? I was wondering if you, you know, yes. Yeah, so, and another way I guess you can term that skill gap is statistical discrimination, but it could uh, be other forms. But I think it could in likeliness be just statistical discrimination. And I guess, yeah, it's hard to kind of justify because there's lots of different contexts where the skill gap could exist. But for example, if you think of the gender context, uh, we're currently working on a study to kind of measure this skill gap in the IT sector to kind of uh, understand the differences in at least beliefs between males, uh, but yeah, beliefs about people's skill in the IT sector. So I think, uh, yeah, it mainly seems to us from our current studies that it's based on statistical discrimination and a lot of the time there doesn't actually, there's not necessarily these differences, these differences don't necessarily exist, it's just, yeah, complete perception. Yeah. If I may just add up on that, so in the case of the household survey, what I observe would be also kind of inconsistent with this notion that there's a less, a, a decrease in productivity because if you look at the trust data, even member of the non-SCST, they don't decrease their trust in the panchayat. At the moment, there is this SC quota. They don't say that there's more uh, crime or like um, feeling of um, uh, safety in the village at the moment of the quota. So that would be also inconsistent. Mm. With Very interesting presentations from all the um, panelists. But I've been wondering, are we getting to the point where we are beginning to see a gestation period? for the effectiveness of uh, affirmative action and a gestation period that may differ 
from one um, is a sector or one activity to the other. And I'm saying this because with education, I think we are beginning to see uh, positive results from affirmative action after perhaps a generation or two. Whereas with race, we are actually going through uh, cyclic motions where you have uh, positive impacts which seem to be reversed over um, after a certain period. So that's my first point, and I'll be interested to know what you think. That the second one is whether we are also experiencing uh, a shifting of the goalposts, um, particularly with reference to meritocracy, as we look at the outcomes of affirmative action. And certain sectors seem to suggest that this may actually be happening, uh, particularly in industry. And I'm looking at the financial uh, sector, where, you know, um, if, if you look at banking staff, where women dominated the lower ranks, they were very, you know, and then as women became more qualified, interestingly, they stayed in the same positions in many of the banks with, with higher education because the goalposts had shifted for rising, you know, within that. These are some of the complexities that I'll be interested in knowing uh, what your observations are. Thank you. Peter, you want to take that for Yes. Yeah. Uh, so responding to your first point, I definitely think there is a gestation period in terms of race. Uh, and you mentioned a generation. We haven't observed a full generation that has been subject to affirmative action legislation yet. We are starting to see effects in higher education, where there is no official affirmative action policy in South Africa, for instance, but where you start seeing uh, the composition of higher education changing, and this should feed through into the rest of the economy. So there's a, I think there's an overlap and a, a complementarity between uh, the changing in the education sector, but also how that uh, allows affirmative action to take effect in the labor market. So um, I think when you mention a gestation period, uh, I think at, at least for, from a labor market race perspective, it could be a generation. Bidisha. Uh, so I just wanted to go back to the backlash question. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that you said that in a, after playing a couple of rounds where you change, after being exposed to quotas a couple of times, uh, you know, people become more accepting of, uh, of, of quotas. Uh, but actually in real life in India, don't you agree that we are act seeing the opposite? We have had a affirmative actions for what, 60 years now? And yet now it is only in the past couple of years where we are seeing upper caste seeking reservations uh, as a backlash um, and I would turn that as a backlash for uh, for quotas for SCSTs. So in my mind I was just trying to reconcile these two findings and what could be the, uh, the how, what could be the explanation. So I would say based on my model that maybe beliefs changing in maybe after some time when you've had quotas for such a long period of time, people maybe start to believe that these people don't deserve quotas anymore because maybe they observe that there's a lot more people in, say, the upper class. But that would be consistent with what I would believe uh, based on my model, but I don't have any data to show that. Mm -hmm.